Good old sir, we're coming in, I'm in our Fragrance video. Welcome to another exciting video, in this case part 26 of my battle series of video. This is the third of my Polish campaign 1939 series of videos. In this video, I'll be comparing each of the sides in the campaign, starting with the economy of both Poland and Germany, and then looking at the Polish armed forces. A critical part in understanding the Polish campaign in 1939 is understanding the differences in the economies between the two combatants, including also the Soviet Union. Let's look at the comparison between Poland and Germany. While Poland was anything but insignificant, it was certainly not a major power in Europe. In 1939, it had a population of 32 million people and covered 111,000 square miles. Its largest city was Warsaw, with 1.2 million inhabitants. Poland's second largest city was Lodz, with about half a million people, and there were four more cities with a population of over 200,000. These were Krakow, Lwów, Vilna and Poznan. Danzig, nominally a free city but strongly influenced by Poland, had a population of 400,000. To Poland's west, there was Germany with 66 million people, 75 million people if you include the newly occupied areas. And to the east was the USSR with 155 million people. In short, it was not the most strategically sound position, or Poland was not in the most strategically sound position, as was surrounded by far more populous, hostile states. While the total population of Poland was certainly respectful, it was only half that of Germany. The difficulty Poland had was the population type and location, or an additional difficulty had was the population type and location. Only 24 million consisted of loyal Polish citizens, and even this was split between the Democrats and the current government. While in 1920 the Polish could expect a high degree of loyalty from the Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Germans, by 1939, all three of these racial groups had been put offside by the extremely pro-Polish decisions of the government. Even if the entire population of Poland could be expected to remain loyal to the government, the second difficulty Poland had was the low level of urbanisation, which means a low level of industrialisation. Less than 3 million people lived in the largest seven cities and possibly only 20% of the population were urbanised with the remainder on small to medium-sized farms. It was this factor more than any other which ensured Poland could never seriously expect to defend itself from any of its neighbours without some major external help. While it had the population to raise and maintain a large army, it did not have the industrial capacity to adequately equip them. Germany, unlike Poland, was not a newly created nation. Although it had lost some territory in the west and east, its population soon recovered to its pre-1914 total and exceeded it by 1939. The only real benefit of losing territory was that the remaining, German ter became, remaining Germany became considerably more racially coherent. However, that's not the entire story, as by 1939 it had also taken over Czechoslovakia and Austria, which brought its population up to even new heights. Apart from the major increase in population Germany experienced in 1938 when it took over Austria and Czechoslovakia, the other major difference, other major difference with Poland was the urbanisation of the country. In Germany, 23 million people lived in the top 25 cities. Germany probably had an urbanisation rate of over 60%, even after the conquests of 1938. It was this high level of urbanisation which gave Germany its significant industrial capacity. Poland was formed from three previously unconnected areas, German Poland, Russian Poland and finally Austro-Hungarian Poland. In addition, a large part of eastern Poland was ethnically Belarusian territory. Each of these almost separate countries had pursued a different level and type of economic development. As a result, the result was that Poland had to spend the first decade of its existence merging and harmonising what it actually had. Poland possessed three main industrial areas, the Austrian West Galatia region, centred at Katowice, Krakow, the Russian industrial regions of Warsaw, Random and Pudatsky, and finally the German Danzig and uh, Bielgorodsk regions. Outside of these areas, Poland possessed a very little industri industry. 
Over 90% of Poland's industrial capacity was centred into these small industrial regions. The bulk of Polish heavy industry was centred in the coal, iron, zinc and lead producing region centred at Katowice. This region contained over 80% of Poland's coal, a third of its iron order and effectively its entire lead and zinc producing areas. Lodz and Random were the only other heavy industrial area if the shipbuilding facilities of Danzig are not counted. Danzig contained shipbuilding facilities, although it was only capable of producing up to a medium-sized naval vessels. Bielodivsk, Warsaw and Lodz contained a great deal of light industry. This was the situation Poland found itself in 1920. Between 1920 and 1929, Poland rapidly built up its industrial capacity, spending most of its efforts in coordinating the region so they could meet the requirements of the nations. The other major area of growth was around Warsaw, where a large number of government-sponsored factories were established. Guns, trucks and aircraft were manufactured in this region, and by 1929, Warsaw was beginning to emerge as a major military-industrial sector in Poland. If we look at this map, we can see that Luol was the logical area to develop industry, that the Poles did not put too much emphasis on this area. In fact, they did not develop much east of Warsaw, as this area was the main battlefield between Poland and Russia in the 1920s. Poland was always concerned about Russia, and developing its industrial in such a way as to make it safe from Russian invasion was a major objective. Unfortunately, this left its industrial capacity very vulnerable to a German attack. This chart shows the GMP or gross national produce of Poland. It must be pointed out that the GMP figure does not tell the entire story, especially when we need to consider the military capacities of a nation's industrial output. While Poland only possessed a GMP percentage figure of 0.4% of global total, its total iron ore production was 1.6% of that of the world, which was not insignificant. However, even this figure was dwarfed by German and Russian iron production. Let's attempt to determine the amount of money spent on the military, and in order to do that, we do have to resort to some guesswork. The percentage of a total nation's GMP which can be spent on the military is finite. Germany was spending about 23% of its GMP in 1937, and it was experiencing severe economic problems as a result. If it was not for the takeover of Austria Czechoslovakia, its economy may well have collapsed. Russia maintained 26%, but this was only sustainable because of the iron fist of Stalin and widespread starvation and personal hardship of the Russian people. The best maximum or most optimal maximum figure would be 15%, which was what Italy was spending in 1937. However, even this rather high figure was not sufficient to maintain even a modest program of development through the Depression. Many Polish military projects were delayed or cancelled due to a lack of money during the Depression. However, the most frightening comparison is with Germany in 1929. Poland spent about $400 million that year, which translates to about 15% of its total GNP. In the same year, Germany spent a similar amount, actually more, which translates in Germany's case to only 1.5% of GNP. The difference was a factor of 10 to 1. When Hitler came to power in 1933, the German nation was still in a terrible depression, although there were signs of recovery. Hitler started a massive rearmament program which had the effect of pulling Germany out of the depression. This military program continued and was further refined by 1939. However, there were severe economic problems in 1939 which caused Hitler to slow his massive expenditure on weapons. Taking Czechoslovakia helped massively, but when Germany went to war in 1939, its production was beginning to level off and it was beginning to experience significant economic problems due to its rapid rearmament program. Therefore, we find that Britain almost produced as many planes as Germany in 1940, yet in 1936, Germany outproduced Britain by almost 3 to 1, to give you an idea of just how much of a war footing Germany was on before the war began. Hitler always had a nagging fear of the German people turning against its leader, as they had in 1918 due to the British blockade. So Hitler always did make sure the living standard of the German people was always good, to prevent a possible stab in the back. Thus, military rearmament was primarily done through debt. By 1918, the war had caused massive suffering and starvation. Hitler wanted to make sure this did never occurred again. 
He achieved this by the rape and pillaging of Austria and Czechoslovakia, more Czechoslovakia, and later in the war, Poland, France, Belgium, and Netherlands, which he extensively looted. It was only in 1942 that he was forced to convert the German economy into a full war production. Although Poland performed miracles in creating an effective economy, its biggest real problem was that it could never hope to match its two neighbours' economic power. 1938, Poland income was estimated at uh, around about $3 billion US, which does not compare very well against Germany's $33 billion US dollars, or even the smaller Russian figure of $31 billion US dollars. However, the real comparison is where we can compare industrial capacity as measured by iron production. Poland's world percentage of this was 1.6% before the war. When we compare this with Germany's 10.7% and Russia's 18.5%, we can see how weak Poland really was in terms of building up the necessary weapons to man its armies against its rather hostile and much larger neighbours. There is one other additional factor to consider which does give some minor benefit to Poland. The Depression did hurt Germany far more than it hurt Poland. During the Depression, the economic differences between the two nations did narrow a reasonable amount. But even in this case, you can see it does not make a sufficient difference to allow Poland to survive against a hostile Germany without external support. When we simply look at these economic numbers, we can see that Poland was in no position to really challenge Germany or even Russia. Therefore, we can see Poland was faced with a hostile, hostile neighbours, which could out outproduce it by 10 to 1, now populated by 2 to 1. Without powerful allies, there could only be one result. Even in this case, Poland still needed to be able to hold out long enough for any of these powerful Western allies to come to its aid, which in 1939 it was unable to do so. The only real hope Poland has was to keep its industry on a permanent wartime footing. This occurred until the early 1930s, when Poland began to devote more of its industrial... But then, after that, Poland began to devote more of its industrial capacity to domestic requirements, as you can imagine why. However, even here, Poland always did spend a reasonable amount of its GNP on its army. Therefore, we can see that Poland did a reasonably good job manufacturing all its military needs, except for its navy. For example, the entire Polish Air Force was of Polish design and manufacture, bulk of its tanks were of Polish design and manufacture, and the bulk of small arms and light weapons were of Polish manufacture. In terms of the ability to produce weapons, that was not the issue. The issue was a lack of economic capacity in order to produce enough of these weapons and to also refresh them adequately over a period of time. The uh, absolute high point of military capacity against Germany were, occurred around about 1930. However, even here we can see some disturbing trends. The most significant is that for Poland to be able to provide or to spend as much as it did, it had to spend an enormous percentage of its total GMP uh, in order to do so, compared with the low figure of Germany, and this was simply not sustainable. We can see, uh, when we look at this table, that Poland was spending per person 33% more than Germany. Yet, if we consider the higher population of Germany in 1930, almost 2 to 1, we can see even in 1930, Germany was outspending Poland. In terms of men in uniform, Poland was far better prepared. But it was, the spending, but it was spending less on each man in the army than Germany. The German army was always going to be better equipped, its men better paid, and its support infrastructure superior. This chart here shows the military balance in terms of divisions. The Polish army had 11 cavalry brigades, which are shown here as 6.5 cavalry divisions. The Germans probably had an unofficial pool of 100,000 men not shown here. Men represent the number of men on active duty, while pools represent the number of trained men available for mobilisation. While the situation in 1930 was tolerable, especially if Poland was on a defensive posture against the Germans, by 1938, the balance was overwhelming. Germany moved from a very low military expenditure to a very high level, far more than even Poland's effort at the time. As we can see by this table, Germany began to dramatically outproduce Poland in 1934. The Polish figures in brackets represent a 25% military expenditure, which is about as high as you can get without destroying your economy. Poland never achieved those figures again, but even if it had decided to go on a full war footing in 1934, and maintained it, it could have still not achieved what it needed to do. 
1936, Germany was spending at a rate of 10 to 1 over poor Poland. Even if we take into account covering the Western Front and the naval expenditure, Germany was rapidly achieving an overwhelming advantage. The Polish nation was a minor nation between two giants. In order to survive, it knew it had to have a large army, which it did initially. In order to maintain its military advantage, it needed a large industrial base to continue to maintain this military. The story of the Polish economy is truly amazing. From the three occupied portions of Poland, Poland managed to create a significant coherent industrial capacity, which was capable of supporting a very impressive army. The tragedy for Poland was that this was simply not sufficient. In 1919, both Germany and Russia lay in ruins. By 1939, this was not the case. The only real hope for Poland was the formation of meaningful alliances, either a combined alliance of minor nations such as the Baltic states, Czechoslovakia, Romania and the Ukraine, or with one of the major powers. Polish nationalism managed to put offside almost all the minor neighbours, leaving Poland with no choice but to ally up with either Russia or Germany. 1934, there was no question but to ally with Germany due to the memories of 1920, but in the end, only a democratic Germany was a real ally, and by 1934, or Germany was anything but a democracy. The only hope Poland had was the Western Allies, which in historical hindsight proved victorious but would only provide victorious for the Poles 50 years after the war. Let's now drill down into the armed forces of Poland in a little bit more detail. The Poles had experience with armed forces from a very early point in their short history, especially due to the nature of the country they fought in. On the Eastern Front, they had captured a number of Russian and German armoured cars and used these in the invasion of Ukraine. After this unhappy experience was over, the Poles began to look at manufacturing their own armoured cars, initially having the French manufacture a number of half-track armoured cars for the Polish army. After the Poles manufactured their own, produce, after that the Poles manufactured their own, producing the WZ-29 in 1926. The Poles not only looked at armoured cars, and from, an er, and from an early date also purchased the French FT-17 and some early British tanks. From these British tanks, they designed and manufactured the TK Ranger tankettes in 1932. This was soon followed by the TKS in 34 and the improved TK3 in 1935. Almost 700 of these vehicles were manufactured during this period, making Poland one of the major tank nations in the world at the time. In 1934, the Poles had also developed the WZ-34 armoured car to replace WZ-29, so they were already on their second generation of armoured cars. The Poles also purchased some British Vickers medium six-ton tanks, which they used to model their own medium tank on. In 1934, they began production of the 7TP tank, an excellent light medium tank similar to the Russian BT range. This was followed up by the 10PTP, but due to money restrictions, this was delayed until late 1939, and thus no 10TP medium tanks ever took, saw action. Seeing the writing on the wall, the Poles began purchasing some French R35 light tanks, which arrived before the invasion, but uh, were not organised in any usable formations during the war, and they all in the end escaped into Romania. The Polish army had the same problem with tanks that most other nations had, that is, how to use their armoured assets. The Poles distributed their tankettes among the infantry and cavalry, their armoured cars among their cavalry, and only just before the war began, began to form independent armoured formations. The first, forma the first formations were the independent tank battalions, which by themselves were not very effective, too small and lack of support. The largest formations were the mechanised brigades. Originally the mechanised brigades were to use 10 TP medium tanks, but these were not ready in time and the independent battalions were roped in. Incidentally, the independent tank battalions that were not part of the mechanised brigades generally got attached to the mechanised brigades and during the war both mechanised brigades had a, a very good armour infantry balance. These formations did have their problems, that's certainly admitted, but overall they were well balanced and designed, there just simply wasn't enough of them. On the 23rd of March, the 1st Mechanised Brigade was formed, the 10th Mech Brigade. On the 1st of September, a 2nd Mech Brigade was formed, the Warsaw Mechanised Brigade. Two independent tank battalions were available by the German invasion, and a third, the 21st Independent Tank Battalion, was being formed when the Germans struck. Most of the independent tank battalions were attached to the Mech Brigades during the war, although not at the beginning. The Polish army uh, did spend an enormous amount of effort in developing their military formations in order to meet the requirements of modern, modern warfare. The, Pol the Polish cavalry brigades were the most interesting and had been developing significantly in the interwar period. 
so that by 1930 they had become basically highly trained, highly motivated and very mobile dragoons. The mechanised brigades were the beginning of an experiment to mechanise all these cavalry brigades. If successful, the Germans would have met 13 powerful mech brigades. However, the amazing efforts in Poland made in the 1920s and the current political instability slowed the uh, military development and spending a great deal. The Poles went backwards in the early 30s and had only begun to redress the situation by the late 1930s, too late to make any difference. If they had not sort of uh, lapsed, they would have been able to have 13 powerful mech brigades available to meet the Germans in 1939. Just how many tanks the Polish had when it was invaded is a bit of a mystery. We can attempt to finalise some numbers. It seems very reasonable. There were 45 FT-17s and 45 R-35 tanks operational in formations when the German struck. The higher figures of 67 FT-17s and 53 R-35s could be the total ordered or total built or something along those lines. The Vickers numbers is probably 34 operational with 50 originally purchased. The armoured car number or total is of interest. There were 80 WZ-34 armoured cars operational with 8 WZ-29s armoured cars. This figure holds up and the figure of 100 armoured cars could be the maximum figure the Polish fielded at the beginning of the German invasion. The 7TP light medium tank figures is where the problems begin. We have 98 of these tanks in formations in 1939, yet 170 were the maximum figure um, according to my sources, which gives us a difference of 72, which is a big difference. Another source implies the real operational figure is 111, which is 13 more than the specified 98, which were in formations. 13 happens to be in a company, so I'd estimate there was a rogue company somewhere, possibly the mysterious first tank company in the Krakow army. Finally, come, we come to the TK or TKS tankets. From a maximum of 700 produced to a minimum of 3, 390, uh, according to some sources, with a likely figure of 429 operational when the Germans invaded. This means there are three additional companies that I can't identify, possibly allocated to the Eastern Group, which is not the main focus of this um, video. According to another source, uh, Orbis, the Polish had 1,350 field artillery pieces. Another method of determining artillery strength is to look at the number of guns allocated to the divisions and brigade and total the lot together. We can see here that the Polish had a lot more AA guns somewhere, possibly allocated defending airfields and other strategic positions. We know that some anti-aircraft guns were allocated at army level, although I can only account for about 25. This leaves a difference of about 2,800. The anti-tank guns were almost all accounted for. The difference of 359 could be explained by assuming these were older guns allocated to reserve formations. The field gun total is interesting. There are 1,350 field guns. Then this roughly equals the total of all 65mm and 75mm guns. There were 1,424 65-75mm guns. Yet we know the Polish had at least 12 independent artillery battalions made up of 105mm and 150mm guns, giving us a further 5 16 guns. The key factor here is possibly what the definition of a field gun is. Let's now look at our source of, um, or one source, which says there are 4,500 guns and mortars. Yet if we add all the guns and mortars, we get a figure of 7,185. This figure is simply too high. If we ignore the 46 mil mortars, then we get a figure of 2,598, which is too low. One possible theory is that our source in indicating a strength of 4,500 guns and mortars, as well as about 1,350 field gun total is the strength of the Polish guns and mortars at the outbreak of war. At this point several divisions had not formed yet, especially the reserve divisions. The 10 reserve divisions constitute a total of 1,362 guns and mortars, which reduces our figure of 7,185 to 5,823 guns and mortars. Still too high, but a lot more reasonable. If we couple this with the fact many Polish formations probably were not fully equipped, then we get close to the possibly magic 4,500 guns and mortars. 
There's a lot of guesswork here. I'm just trying to arrive at what could be the, uh, the accurate figure and um, it's not that easy in order to do so. The Polish Army used a wide variety of artillery pieces from the 65mm field gun to the 155mm howitzer. By far the most common artillery piece was the French 75M 1897-14 field gun, followed by the Austrian M 1400mm howitzer. The Polish Army had a good anti-tank gun, however there were probably too few of them. The Polish Army also had a very good anti-aircraft gun, however in this case the problem was even more extreme. The Polish Air Force um, dated in embryonic form from the end of World War I, even before Poland gained its independence. In December 1918, Polish airmen who had served in the French, Austrian, Imperial Russian Air Force swore allegiance to the Polish Republic. In September 1919, a commander in chief was appointed and a reorganisation undertaken, which established an air force as part of the army. One of the highlights of the Polish defence against the Germans was its air defence. The Air Force was more prepared for the invasion than the Army. When the Germans invaded on the 1st, it had all its aircraft distributed and hidden in wartime airfields, safe from a surprise German air strike. As a result, the, German, the Germans destroyed very little on the ground initially and quickly switched targets to the Polish Army and its communications. The major issue with the Polish Air Force was its poor fighter force made up of obsolete PZL P7s and the very average PZL P11Cs. While good by the standards of most fighters of the late 30s, it was no match for the ME109, which was an excellent modern fighter. If the Polish fighters found themselves against German bombers or ME110s, they gave a good count of themselves. However, once the ME109s arrived, the Polish fighters had little chance. Nonetheless, the Polish Air Force continued to fight until their bases were overrun, which was generally in the first two weeks of the war. A good idea of how effective the Polish Air Force was can be demonstrated by German air losses. The Germans lost 285 aircraft and a further 276, 79 damage beyond repair. This was about 25% of their total initial air force. The Poles lost 284 aircraft in combat and a further 149 from other sources. The Polish organised their air units into air regiments. For example, number 113, the OWL squadron, was attached to the 1st Air Regiment. The Polish organised their bombers into Dion's of 9 aircraft rather than squadrons. Uh, Dion X or 10 slash 1 was also part of the 1st Air Regiment, which was based in Warsaw in 1939. Another interesting point about the Polish Army was the Polish attached aircraft to the Army formations and also had an independent Air Force formations. Four P-37 Los Dion's were part of the Independent Bomber Command, the 211, the 212, 216 and 217 Dion. The others were attached to Army formations such as our X or 10 slash 1 Dion. We know that seven P-23 Dion's were attached to land armies and five were with the Independent Bomber Command. The Independent Bomber Commands were sometimes called the Bomber Brigade. The nomenclature is a bit of an area of confusion. We have in one case designations such as the 113 Squadron, 1st Air Regiment, and then we have the uh, 3-3, which was part of the 3rd Air Regiment. I feel the designations such as the 10-1 and 3-3 are army-attached formations, with the first number being the specific formation and the second number being the air regiment. So 10-1 means 10th squadron, part of the 1st air regiment, and 3-3 is the 3rd squadron, part of the 3rd air regiment. On the other hand, we know the number 113 squadron was part of the 1st air regiment in one source, the 3rd air regiment which would indicate army attachment. It's possible that independent formations may have been attached to air regiments during the course of the war. Thus, this can be explained. And so we come to an end of my part 26 of my military history video covering the Polish campaign in 1939. In this video, we compare the economies of Germany and Poland and look at a, and take a more in-depth look at the Polish armed forces. Alle guten Dingen, kommen zu einem Ende!